Good evening. Thank you for joining us for Sustainability and Discontents, Contents, uh, which is part of the Daniels for a series. I'm Richard Summer, Dean of the Dan John H. Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape and Design here at the University of Toronto, and I'll be hosting and moderating tonight's discussion. As you may know, each year, the Daniels faculty organizes an, ex an ambitious collection of public events, including evening lectures, exhibitions, symposia, uh, and for a full list of our events, I would advise you to visit our website. We started this particular series, the Daniels Fora, four years ago with the goal of engaging a broader public audience in critical discussions about architecture, landscape, and the design and building of cities. We bring an international and local cast of designers, scholars, and professionals who are working in the fields of architecture, media, science, politics, commerce, and, and broadly speaking, in the area of urbanism, to this stage. I should mention that within a few years, we hope to hold these, these events in our new platform at One Spadina Crescent, uh, which you can see under construction on, on Spadina. So, the Daniels faculty at, the, at this point is not just doing research on, sponsoring debate around city building, we're doing a little bit of city building ourselves. So our four are meant to focus on new design ideas and practices and emerging development and community-based philosophies about city building in the form of a moderated debate. As before, this evening's discussion promise to be, promises to be both timely and lively. But before I tell you more about tonight's debate and the issues at stake and introduce our featured speakers, I'd like to express my gratitude to our friends at Herman Miller who have once again generously provided the furnishings and support uh, and the furnishings you see on the stage uh, that, we, uh, that accommodate us during a discussion. We always appreciate the opportunity to showcase Herman Miller's award-winning designs and are thankful for their continued support. Now, for those of you that have been to some of our previous four events, you may notice uh, a trend that's emerging uh, in these discussions. A couple of years ago, there was an event called Toronto, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, in which we juxtaposed how an architect, a literary critic, and a filmmaker account for and construct the city through their work. We held another event entitled Jane Jacobs Undone, in which two architecture and planning theorists offered a rather critical assessment of Jacobs' work but even more so of the way her ideas have been interpreted by her followers. And I dare say, uh, um, so in, in the sense that many of her followers are not wanting to acknowledge how much of a free market advocate Jane Jacobs was. We had another four event entitled Risky Business, Financing the City, in which we collected a group of architects, real estate developers, investment and market experts, and investment and market experts to discuss the great extent to which private capital and developers are driving the building and formation of cities like Toronto. And what is at play in that process? Our most recent fora last January was entitled Metropolis and Mobile Life, uh, a play on the famous uh, George Zimmel essay. On how, and this event looked at how cities, um, well, there was a play on George Zimmel's essay on how cities literally change our personalities and social lives. And in this event, a transit designer and a journalist showed the extent to which transit challenges we face are not going to be solved just by making more infrastructure or by deciding between a subway and a streetcar, uh, but require understanding the culture of automobiles and other ways of moving through the city, and will require our willingness to experiment with policies and actually small changes to the existing infrastructure that can influence citizens' everyday habits and expectations. We have had other four events around, for example, around the issue of the relationship of human health to the city and to architecture. Tonight, we're, going to, we're taking on a term and a subject that has been lurking behind many of these discussions, sustainability. Sustainability is one of those terms like productivity or efficiency that stand in for a whole range of aspirations and more often anxieties uh, that individuals and so societies have about their well-being and their survival into the future. We recently had an historian, Daniel Abramson, speak at our faculty about research he's doing on the, how the idea of obsolescence was adopted by an emerging real estate industry in the first half of the 20th century. And how, with the wind of modernism behind them, these real estate entrepreneurs convinced many cities 
to rip down entire districts and rebuild them anew, operating uh, as automobiles de de designers were at, at mid-century with the notion that a change in form and style could churn uh, a whole, a whole a, you know, a, a, a lot of transformation and sell a lot of product. Now, curiously, Abramson argued that the idea of obsolescence in the built environment started to be replaced as early as the late 1960s with a set of concepts that are the cornerstones of what we've come to understand as sustainability, at least in the urban context. And what, he, what he's speaking to here is a, a, a set of things which emerged in the late 1960s and bring us to the present, the preservation movement, the ecological movement, various forms of postmodern architecture, from concrete brutalism, or what we've come to call brutalism, uh, which sought, so, sought to build in a very heavy way and for the ages, and of course, within, with the postmodernism, the revisiting of, of historical forms and typologies. For him, for, for, for the argument that, that Abramson's making, you could, you could really imagine that something like uh, the brutalist buildings from the 1970s, of which we have many in, in Toronto, and new urbanism, which is a, 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 for, a form of traditional or neo-traditional town making, are all a part of this changing historical trajectory and, and, and an idea or a, a set of uh, notions about uh, how we need to build the city differently and how we think about, um, uh, in a way, uh, a more nuanced and, and uh, um, overlapping set of conditions in the city. Of course, terms and buzzwords can become exhausted and at times lose luster. When we talk about re uh, uh, remaking the city, we don't, use, we don't tend to use, for example, although Vishan might tonight, we don't tend to use the term density as much as we used to because, um, well, uh, because it has some funny connotations for people. No, no one wants to be dense. Uh, so we talk about intensification instead. Now, given the changing consciousness about, uh, uh, and changing state of our environment, we're pulling back from now and arguing, uh, back from arguments that we can sustain our current way of life or reform our societies enough to sustain uh, the Earth's ecology. We see with the, with the change in, in, uh, the car, in, in, uh, in the ecology uh, across the entire Earth that we are maybe in a condition of, uh, of no return. So now accepting that we cannot forestall some of the processes in play, maybe we can forestall others, we are now using the term resilience more often than sustainability. In the face of ecological and economic and social upheaval and crises, which are now fairly seen, seen as fairly constant, those of who work on, uh, work on cities are being asked to make them more resilient so they can survive these things. The argument goes, of course, if we're not resilient, we'll be left behind. Unfortunately, the history of city planning is full of elaborate prescriptions that have been offered to solve problems that have sometimes not been well-defined or understood. Obsolescence, for example, the, the, the story in Abramson I referred to is working on, um, was a concept to overcome blight, the idea of blight. Preservation was supposed to not only preserve the physical fabric of the city, but also its social life as well. And these things have not always come to pass either. So I'm going to show a f just a few images. Look, the, the, the words came back. Um, a few images for context uh, before we move on to the introduction of our, of our guests. Just to introduce the idea that in the history of architecture, in the history of planning, in the history of urbanism from, uh, from, from a century back, we, uh, we see that this idea of the intensified and integrated and megacity uh, had many incarnations. The earliest, and I think the most profound of which, was from the futurist and from the architect Santa Elia, um, who designed this city where the airport, the trains, the cars, everything was in, uh, integrated into one large hive, but also, uh, in working with the futurists, described the city as something which each, each generation would tear down and rebuild for themselves. So. The irony, of course, is this is a highly monumental proposal, yet they're proposing a city that's actually quite more like Las Vegas uh, in, in the way that it works through history. Um, we're more familiar with this one from uh, a number of years later, from the interwar years, uh, the tower and the park model, and then this high, th this high density city, which is also about integration uh, and dense urban living. <clears throat> 
Now, we know that the, in, in the way in which cities are built, this is a, an aerial view of Hong Kong, all of these models in some ways have been experimented with and you can see come into play. But one of the things I think is going to come into play tonight is that in an environment like North America, and this does not include Canada, this is an a, a American map or a United States map, um, you see other phenomena uh, come into play in the way in which the environment comes together. Does anyone ha have any idea what this map might be because the, 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 gra the, the words aren't clear? This is actually a map of all of the Walmart distribution uh, sites in, in, um, in the United States. Uh, and this is uh, from a, um, uh, a, a young scholar. This, this article is in, in Place's journal that we're one of the sponsors of. Uh, a young uh, scholar named Estes worked on this. This is a comparison of the, of the uh, land use of Walmarts in the United States and the island of Manhattan. Uh, and the article goes into great detail about the size of the economy of Walmart, that it's, if you put it in the, in the, in the world, it's, 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 like a, it's, it's, it's like a major country, right? And then uh, other interesting maps, for example, Vermont passed a law where they wanted to keep uh, Walmarts out of their towns so, uh, so that they would not be built. And this shows how Walmart basically corralled themselves around Vermont and with their service stations in order to uh, still uh, um, um, have, have the potential to overtake the market. So you see this kind of infrastructure uh, is is going full force, uh, certainly in the United States, I'd say to some extent in Canada, around things like energy and resources. Um, and these are, these are related maps from uh, of my former colleague, Alan Berger, who's now at MIT, his book, Drawscape. Uh, he works on what he calls the other, he calls it the other 95%. He said, architects and planners are concentrating on the, not, the 5%. Vijan will say it's 3% that is actually urbanized, right? Uh, and he's looking at these places on, on the edges and looking at places like Atlanta. That's the, the, the small circle in the center is the, is the, is the uh, footprint of Atlanta in 1950 and showing the way in which the environment has, uh, to use a term that will come up in, uh, tonight, sprawled uh, and what that means for industry and where industry takes place and also where housing is built uh, when that industry develops. So uh, I don't have too much more to, I, I wanted to show uh, some home cities for people that will, 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 will for tonight. This is, this is uh, actually Chicago, uh, where uh, Bob Brugman uh, lives. This is uh, a, a city that uh, is often thought of as the, as the uh, mothership of sprawl, uh, Los Angeles, but actually in the calculations has overtaken this city, which is Manhattan, as, 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 as the most densely developed uh, or densely populated territory in the United States. You have Shenzhen in China, we have Mumbai, and here we have Toronto, which is another city which is actually uh, part of this dynamic of, uh, of, of, of uh, downtown and periphery and includes, uh, uh, well, this isn't part of Tor Toronto, but it's part of the Toronto metropolitan area that is Mississauga. So, uh, so in convening this conversation tonight, my interest in, is, is making sure that we're asking the right questions when we advocate and work to build the city, one kind of city or another. And to do this, we have asked two of the most knowledgeable and well-informed individuals on the current state of the North American city that, that, that I, I think uh, um, are uh, active today, Vishan Chirkabarty and Robert Brugman. The discussion is particularly timely because especially in Toronto, where because there are more, as we know, there are more high rises under construction than any other city in North America in our downtown. And at the same time, we have various divisions between the suburbs and the downtowns after the amalgamation of the city. Uh, so the city seems to grow larger every day, but, but we have all of the conditions, a uh, multitude of conditions to contend with. Here, as in many other large cities around the world, the b debate about how to grow and build more sustainably is ongoing, and one that planners, architects, and citizens are, are I think, in Toronto are particularly passionate about. So when we push to make cities more sustainable, or in the more recent coinage, resilient, uh, Often this is occurring in the absence of a clear definition of precisely what we mean by a city in geographic, social, or economic terms. And we need to have clear, a clearer context for measuring evidence on how cities perform and, and be more conscious of the biases and contradictions inherent in many of the current solutions being touted for addressing urban problems. And this is the crux of the matter for tonight. 
So let me go on to introduce our two speakers, um, and um, I'll introduce them in the order they're going to speak. Uh, Vishan Chikrabarti is the author of the new book, A Country of Cities, A Manifesto for Urban America. You'll see it in the lobby. Uh, his book argues that dense urban environments are key to overcoming challenges of economic degradation, unsustainable consumption, economic stagnation, and decreased social mobility. Chirkabardi is the Mark Halliday Associate Professor of Real Estate Development and the Director of CURE, the Center for Real Estate, Urban Real Estate at Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation. He is a highly experienced architect, planner, and, uh, and uh, has been also active in the real estate industry. Um, and he's transformed the, 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 this real estate program in, at, at, at Columbia um, remarkably. Uh, he's also, when he's not doing all the things he's doing uh, and writing books, uh, 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 all the things he's doing at Columbia Ray Books, he's a partner at Shop Architects, where he advances large-scale projects on a worldwide scale. From 2002 to 2005, he served as the director of the Manhattan office for New York City, the New York City uh, Department of City Planning, uh, and after that was, uh, was an executive vice president at related companies. So he has sat in many of the seats and in many of the places that uh, one ne needs to sit to understand how the city is being made and remade today. Robert Brugman is the author of the best-selling book, Sprawl, A Compact History. His book challenges the prevailing negative conceptions surrounding suburban growth. He argues that in planning the future of our cities, we must embrace the broad spectrum of suburban geographies that continue to be the mainstay of development and sites where people are living today. Brugman is an historian, and that is really the, 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 uh, the, the basis for his work, is, is going back and actually looking at history and understanding how some of these phenomena that we, that we don't always understand or, or sometimes take for granted uh, came to be. And he, he's an historian, but he's also a critic and an oft, often cited commentator on the built environment. He received his PhD in art history at, from the University of Pennsylvania and um, has been, since 1979 has been a professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago, uh, where is he, he's currently a distinguished professor emeritus of art history, architecture, and urban planning. He has published many books and articles on, uh, on, archite on architecture, cities, uh, with a particular focus on the city of Chicago. So I'm going to uh, ask Vishan to come to the stage first, uh, and we're going to proceed. Thank you. Thank you much, Richard, for that introduction. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I can tell already that this question of intensification in Toronto is a big deal, uh, that it's a very big topic. I actually, a reporter from the Globe and Mail called me about this talk tonight last week, and um, I noticed after the article came out, I looked at the comments on the website, and one of the comments, you know, I, I talked about the advantages of cities, and one of the comments on the website was, why doesn't this guy go back to New Delhi where he came from? Uh, <laughs> which, I thought was, which I thought was very funny, even though I'm actually not from New Delhi, I'm from New York. Um, uh, uh, and, uh, and it's true, we actually in the United States uh, use the term uh, densification as opposed to intensification because we actually, oh, I think that one's mine. Oh. Right, sorry. <laughs> To rescue my water. Um, um, we actually use the term density instead of intensity because uh, we are, we're Americans and we like being dense. Uh, and we like being uh, dense about a number of topics, including uh, density. Uh, uh, and so, as uh, Richard mentioned, I uh, have worked in, I've uh, been fortunate enough to work in a number of different capacities. And one of the things that I've really noticed about all of these professions that hover around the built environment, be it uh, architecture or uh, urban planning, uh, the legal profession, the real estate profession, is that we're all extremely siloed. We talk to each other in, in very, very um, constrained ways, uh, often in uh, very pejorative and kind of ideological ways. Uh, the developer is the bad guy, for the developer, the architect is the person who spends their money. You know, the, the, the list goes on and on. Um, and what, what I really believe is that those divisions and those silos have actually put the planet in the crosshairs. Uh, 
uh, that the people responsible for the built environment actually haven't been very responsible, uh, and, has re and this has resulted uh, in a lot of problems. Um, and it, it begins with, uh, in many schools of architecture and planning, you hear this idea that the world is urbanizing, that somewhere around 2007 we hit an inflection point and more people live in, uh, in uh, urban areas than rural areas. Uh, the problem is, is if you travel the world, you actually don't experience that phenomenon. What you really experience is not that the world is urbanizing, but that the world is suburbanizing at a very rapid rate. Um, and uh, I think those distinctions are extraordinarily important because what we have in the world today is we have about seven billion people and about two billion of those people are moving towards middle class lifestyles. And if those two billion people adopt the same middle class lifestyles that you know, a few hundred million people in the West have uh, heretofore adopted, we have an enormous, enormous resource problem uh, worldwide that I don't think we're gonna solve uh, simply through some of the methods that we're looking at right now. Uh, and so the book that um, Richard mentioned uh, is really focused on the United States because I believe the United States is the, the sort of fountainhead of this issue, if you will. Um, and if you look at the United States today, we're using land at twice the rate of our population growth. Uh, our houses are getting bigger and bigger, and yet our population in terms of the actual size of our average family is shrinking. Uh, and uh, so this is related to this phenomena that uh, Richard called sprawl. Um, and I believe this is directly related to the fact that we still have an extraordinary economic crisis in the United States. Uh, we have about 11 million people whose uh, houses are underwater, meaning that they uh, have more debt on their homes than what their homes are worth, struggling with student, death, he student debt, health care debt, uh, all sorts of debt. And I believe this is directly tied to the density at which uh, uh, most Americans live, with 60% of Americans living in uh, single-family homes, and only about 4% of Americans living in uh, more than 30 dwelling units per acre, which is a sort of standard density metric of units per acre. So this is roughly 30 units per acre is about um, 75 units per hectare. Um, and the reason uh, I'm very focused on that metric, and it's a term that's defined in the book called hyperdensity, and the idea behind that term is that it is sufficient density to support rapid mass transit. Uh, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Now, uh, many people, uh, I think, somewhat, somewhat incorrectly believe that the book is meant to be anti-suburban, and I'm sure we're going to talk about that tonight. And it really isn't. I, I, I believe very wholeheartedly in free choice. What the book tries to unpack, however, is that the landscape of the United States uh, in the post-World War II era particularly, uh, has been heavily subsidized. And has been heavily subsidized to influence the fact that 60% of Americans live in single-unit, uh, single-family detached houses. And it really starts, of course, with the Eisenhower, uh, uh, the Federal um, National Highway and Defense Act, and the building of the interstate system. But to this day, if you look at the extraordinary amount of money that we in the United States put towards roads, uh, as opposed to rail-based transit. Uh, uh, it, it really pales by comparison. Um, and then if you look at energy, uh, in terms of the subsidies that go to the oil and gas industries as opposed to renewables. Um, and then uh, uh, in, in, in the United States, this is different in Canada, but in the United States, the, the big uh, whammy of them all, the mortgage interest deduction, which costs the federal government about $100 billion annually. Uh, it is the largest subsidy in the system. Uh, both economists on uh, the left and the right side of the political aisle agree that it's very bad policy, that it actually doesn't incentivize home ownership, and what it truly does is it incentivizes people to buy larger homes. Um, and what is interesting is if you look uh, at the countries that don't have the mortgage interest deduction, you have essentially about the same level of home ownership. So this idea that you need this massive federal intervention in the system in order for people to buy homes doesn't really hold up to uh, the data. But the problem is, of course, we in the United States, in, in the act of being dense, um, double down on the strategy of fueling the mortgage machine uh, of, of the American uh, real estate industry through the Subprime Mortgage uh, uh, Act and, and, and through uh, many of the things that we did uh, as a country, as a federal government uh, in the beginning of the century. 
um, which resulted in an extraordinary amount of debt. Um, and what you see is this spike where uh, our mortgage debt in the U.S. reached almost 80% of GDP uh, between 2000 and 2010, and the vast majority of the people who were using that debt were using them for single-family homes as opposed to multifamily homes. Um, and so I believe what this is really about is, and many people believe that I'm somehow attacking the American dream, but that this is not the American dream that this is actually the, the scheme of consumption, the American scheme. The idea that people come and they take on more debt and they buy more stuff and they buy bigger cars to put that, George Carlin has a great routine about this, uh, they buy more stuff uh, 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 and then they have cars and houses and so forth and that relates to this uh, uh, loss, loss of prosperity over time. Now, when I look back, and I'll be interested to hear what Bob has to say about this because he's actually the historian, um, I find no mention in the early ideas of the American dream about a single family home or a patch of grass or so forth. Um, it was really um, one of the first that I found, this is the only slide I'll read out loud, it is not a dream of motor cars and high wages merely, but a dream of social order in which each man and each woman shall be able to attain to the fullest stature of which they are innately capable and be recognized by others for what they are, regardless of the fortuitous circumstance of birth or position, and that was written in 1931. Um, and so to me, this is the American dream. This notion that people come, people come from whether they come from Toledo or Taiwan, uh, that they work hard, that they get their kids a better uh, place, to a better place in life. This notion of the classless society that we may not be living up to entirely, but is very much, I think, at the heart of what the true American dream is. Um, now, when you look at cities today in terms of that, uh, there's very little question about where a lot of that opportunity is available. Um, and, you know, Dan Doktoroff, my former boss uh, in the Bloomberg administration, who's the deputy mayor for economic development, um, he had this theory that essentially that as more residents come into cities that they pay more in taxes and if those cities are smart, they put money into quality of life investments that creates more economic opportunity and more prosperity in cities. And this, of course, uh, it, to me rings very much of the theories that Jane Jacobs talked about in terms of import replacement and the notion that small cities grow into large cities over time by developing the ability to uh, replace the imports that they naturally need as small cities and therefore grow into cities of exports uh, and therefore create, again, opportunity. Um, we did some very interesting work at Columbia. I had a research team that looked at this that showed that 3% of the American landmass generates about 90% of the US GDP as a consequence of these forces that both Dan Doktoroff and I think Jane Jacobs were talking about. Uh, and this is an extraordinary concentration of productivity. Um, and uh, it's interesting, the US Conference of Mayors had this number at about 26% of the American landmass, but we actually did uh, some more ingrained data in terms of the metropolitan statistical areas and found that it was very, very concentrated in the inner cities with about 86% of US jobs being generated on this very small portion of, uh, uh, of our landmass. Um, Bob's hometown of Chicago generates more economic productivity than 42 states in the United States, including some of our most productive states. Um, but of course, what happens in the US is uh, we don't get to keep the prosperity that we generate. So what happens is cities generate tax revenue and economic prosperity, but then it has to get redistributed out to suburban regions. New York City, for instance, last year generated about $16 billion in federal tax revenue that it never got back in terms of federal expenditures, about $2 billion to the state, um, our equivalent of provinces, obviously. Uh, Richard showed Hong Kong. I mean, what is interesting about Hong Kong, of course, is it keeps all of that economic productivity and that tax revenue, which is why when you go to Hong Kong, there's a beautiful subway system, there's a beautiful train from the airport, there's a beautiful airport. The other thing, I think, to keep in mind about Hong Kong, which is people always think about it as this, but that's only about one-third of the land mass of Hong Kong. About two-thirds of Hong Kong is uh, nature trails and is preserved nature because of the terrain of Hong Kong. Hong Kong, and so it's actually quite a green city from a certain perspective. Um, that, that doesn't mean that all of us have to live in Hong Kong or all of us have to live in New York. This is a traditional Japanese farming village 
Um, and what you see here, as opposed to, say, what you see in the United States that came as a consequence of, again, the Jeffersonian grid and the Homestead Act and a bunch of historical factors, what you see here, and this is my grandfather was born in a village in India that looked very much like this, where the villagers and the farmers cluster together and they farm the land around them. And there's an extraordinary efficiency to that. Because if you think about the one sewer line and the one power line and the one water line that you have to run, as opposed to the madness of each farmer living out in their house, uh, as well as the sort of frayed social fabric that results from that, and so forth. And so this notion that sustainability is associated with density, I think, is extremely important. And um, it's interesting, when you look at the average carbon footprint per person, this idea that technology is going to somehow save us, that if you take a McMansion and then put solar panels and windmills, and my favorite is the electric car. In most of North America, when you drive an electric car, what you do is you transfer gas emissions to electric emissions, which are coal-powered uh, uh, power plants. So you're actually making the environment worse in most cases. Um, technology is not going to save us from ourselves. Uh, what's interesting is you look at the urban average, however, when people live in apartments that heat and cool each other and they take mass transit, they already are ahead of the curve on a per person basis. If you then apply technology to that, you have the ability to really create a much more sustainable framework uh, at a very large scale. Now, of course, there are other issues. It's not just about sustainability in terms of energy efficiency. There are other issues in terms of public health and joy. And uh, the, the data on that is interesting. Uh, actually, uh, and this, it's in, you actually see a slightly larger amount of obesity statistics happening in inner cities. It drops at the first ring in suburbs. And then as you get into exurbs, you start to get into more and more problems with all of the health conditions associated excuse me, associated with that. There's a great Swedish study that was done that proved that absence does not make the heart grow fonder, that actually with commute times uh, increase uh, divorce times. Um, and then this, and I think this is in some ways the most powerful factor that's going on, which is uh, we can have an academic debate tonight, uh, and that's fine. But in the United States, at least, we've got 80, millenni excuse me, 80 million millennials, uh, meaning 80 million people, largest demographic cohort in the history of the United States, uh, born in the 80s and 90s. And uh, these folks are showing an enormous resistance to moving to suburbs. Uh, they are very concerned about student loan debt. They're not interested in housing debt. They're not interested in car debt. Even after they have kids, they are moving to other cheaper cities if they can't afford, say, the New Yorks or the San Francisco's. Uh, and uh, uh, all sorts of data is showing us that these, these folks aren't buying cars, for instance. Uh, car companies are very, very worried because uh, they're sharing cars, they're doing all sorts of things, uh, and of course, bicycling and so forth. And so this appeal for young professionals, I think, is, makes this much less of a sort of academic question and more a question of a very significant trend. And of course, that trend is tied to the experience of it all, that people are tired of living this way. They want to maybe have a drink before they get on a, a streetcar on their way home, as opposed to worried about drinking and driving or, uh, or uh, texting while driving. But the most important thing is that we live in a service economy today, and the notion of saving time becomes extraordinarily important. And so this idea that we could create a walkable city, this is a kind of utopic vision. It doesn't really exist in any city in the world. But this idea that we had this walkable city of culture and diversity is something that I think many, many young people are striving for. And I think it needs to be done in a way that is very much uh, I'll say a North American solution. Uh, many uh, uh, folks in the planning business uh, say, yes, density is great, but we like cities like Paris. We don't like all these skyscrapers. The problem, of course, is that Paris is very dense. It's about 80 units an acre, uh, but uh, it also has extraordinary problems of segregation as a consequence of the inability to build in Paris and the inability to actually meet housing demand. And so you have this outer ring, and if you've read this book, The Great Inversion by Alan Erlenholt, he talks about the fact that in the US, the suburbs are getting much, much poorer, and that if you start confining poor people to the suburbs, that you have a lack of social mobility that can lead to intergenerational poverty because of the way they are uh, uh, trapped from other income groups in terms of what that means for schooling, school systems, mobility, and so forth. Um, so 
we as planners actually have uh, done a lot of this. This is again is government intervention in the system where we've over-regulated our housing markets. We've actually brought the density down in most of our major metropolitan areas uh, over the course of the 20th century to the point where in the United States today, only 12% of the zoned land in the United States uh, can support rapid mass transit. It's an extraordinary figure, and I think it very much has to do with a misinterpretation of the urban planner's role. Uh, this notion that the urban planner's role is only to listen to community, even when communities want down zonings, even if they want down zonings because they want a more racially homogenous environment around them, that we're supposed to listen to those communities. Uh, and this has created really a, a, a crisis in terms of the, um, the state of uh, uh, the U.S. today and its landscape. Uh, planners, I think, have become much too conservative. Um, there is a way to actually unleash a lot of interesting mo urban morphology in terms of how air rights transfers can work and so forth to give us a much more interesting, much more uh, variegated city. Architecture, of course, is critically important in all of this because you're certainly not going to sell people on the idea of living more densely if you can't have the sense of public joy and public beauty. Um, and this, of course, is important. And it's very interesting to me that in the U.S., that city after city, I mean, these are examples from Texas, this, of course, in Seattle, city after city is uh, doubling down on the idea of building great architecture, of building great parks. Again, these are not the big wealthy East Coast cities. This is Chicago, um, St. Louis, um, and this is Dallas. Um, and are all in this effort to attract this young human capital, which of course is critical to their economic well-being. So what the book argues for is that if you take a place like Dallas and you look at all of the surface parking that's available and you look at what has begun to be a mass transit infrastructure, that if you densify Dallas, that you could actually support much more ridership for that infrastructure, you could build much more parks and so forth with the value generation from that density, uh, and that you could create a more urban environment. That is not to argue for density for density's sake. Uh, and I try to be very clear about this. This is D Dubai. I, I learned uh, architecture as a skyscraper architect. I always learned that you built skyscrapers when you ran out of land. Manhattan, right? It's an island that's cordoned off by water, so you go up. Uh, you go to Dubai, and there's all these tall buildings, and there's nothing but land all around you. It's kind of extraordinary. And there's a token mass transit system for South Asian guest workers, but really, it's very, very car-oriented. And so that's not the kind of density I'm talking about. I'm talking about a density that really rests on what I like to call an infrastructure of opportunity, which is not just the infrastructure that moves people and sewage and water and power, but also the infrastructure that creates social mobility great schools, great urban parks, great medical care, and great affordable housing, which I'll talk about right at the end. Um, we in the United States have seen a precipitous drop in infrastructure uh, investment since the Eisenhower era, uh, particularly in terms of our rail system. And so again, if you look at just um, uh, sort of item after item, what you find is that the government has intervened in very significant ways to give us the landscape uh, that we have in the United States that presents as a free market choice, but actually is a highly manipulated choice in terms of where we've decided to put our dollars. Um, this in contrast to, say, China. Uh, this is China and the United States, the continental U.S. laid over on, at scale. Um, if we had the bullet train that the Chinese are running today, we could get from downtown Atlanta to downtown New York City in three hours. Uh, it would transform the eastern seaboard. Uh, a third of the nation's air traffic goes through the three New York airports. We have 36 flights a day from the three New York airports to Philadelphia. It's utter madness. Uh, it's not the way any other developed country uh, works in the world. And again, what it costs us, and many uh, uh, economists on the right uh, side of the spectrum have talked about the amount of money that the U.S. is losing to congestion and the amount of productivity we're losing to congestion. Um, this is, I'll, I won't go into this in detail, but this is a, a, a project that our office did in terms of the rebuilding of Penn Station. Um, if you've been to Penn Station, you know you never want to go there again. Um, and what re this really is, is talking about how to use density and development value to rebuild a station and a park system um, all around with a, a brand new train station with high-speed rail coming into New York City. 
Um, we have to rely on mechanisms like that in the U.S. because of our politics. Uh, you've had a, a first-hand viewing in the last couple of weeks of how functional our politics are in the U.S. Um, what is really interesting, though, that gets, uh, you know, so this big government shutdown, so much of this is about the deficit, right? The Republicans care about the deficit. Um, but then if you look at the numbers, this is the 2004 electoral map, and if the state has less than one, it means that it is a donor state. It puts more money into the federal system than it takes out. If the, if the number is uh, more than one, that means it's a recipient state. It takes more money out of the federal system than it puts in. Uh, so on average, what you see is our blue states are about a dollar in and a dollar out. Our red states are about a dollar in and about a dollar forty out in federal expenditures. So if you really want to understand where the deficit is, um, I think the Republicans need to look uh, largely in their own house. Um, I'm going to... So, so that's just a sort of unpacking of, of things like, well, if you're going to build density, you need infrastructure. I'm going to close with this question of affordability, because I'm sure Bob will tell you, and I hope he'll tell you rightly, that most walkable places are the most expensive places that we have in the United States. Uh, and I, I think that's true. The correlation is quite strong. Um, but of course, again, this is not some coincidence. We as a nation used to believe in things like public housing. And, of course, you know, professional after professional will show you a picture of Pruitt Igo blowing up. Uh, but, in fact, we have a lot of successful public housing, Tower in the Park housing that was built uh, during the post-war era. This was by Mies van der Rohe in, uh, uh, in Detroit. Um, uh, but we stopped doing that. Um, and we now have this enormous lack of affordable housing across our country. Uh, affordable housing being defined as 30% of your pay going to housing with 70% going to other things. Um, and by that metric, since 1960, we've had about a 40% loss of affordable housing across the United States. Um, and so what we built throughout most of the 20th century is this tower in the park stuff. Uh, it was a great investment in public housing. I'm going to disagree with Richard a little bit in that this stuff actually isn't that dense. It's only, uh, it's only about three FAR, sometimes it's about two FAR. I think a lot of times in architecture we think towers in the park are dense, but they actually end up being quite low density. It's like Hilversheimer was dense, um, uh, Le Corbusier wasn't. Yeah, I mean, it, what's, what's interesting, th this is lower density than brownstone neighborhoods in Toronto. Um, so what we did is in 1986, we under Reagan, we passed tax reform, we abolished the public housing system we had in cities, and now we have this tax credit system. What's wonderful, actually, about the tax credit system is what it creates in, in New York, and I'm not sure exactly if you have the equivalent here, are these 80-20 rental, rental apartment buildings. So it's 80% market, 20% uh, low-income housing, quite low-income housing. And it's interesting to me, I've done a couple of lectures in Latin America over the last uh, uh, few months, and people are shocked to hear that we actually have a system where low-income people live in the same building, use the same lobby, the same elevator, as upper-income people. And I think it's actually a great testament to our society that we're able to pull that off. And now, in fact, uh, our office is working on millions of square feet of what they call 50-30-20, which is 50% market, 30% middle income, 20% low income, uh, which I think is a, great, uh, is a great thing. The problem with this system is there's nowhere near enough money in the system to create enough affordable units. Um, and that, of course, is, again, if you look back at that chart that I showed you on mortgage interest deduction, the main place where the U.S. government is making its investment in, in housing is in wealthy suburban home ownership. That's where the money is going. It's not going into urban affordability. It's part of why cities are so expensive. Now, just to end with this, is basically that more density clearly allows a developer to amortize the cost of land, expensive land, over more units. Um, and in terms of construction, you get advantages as you get to higher density. Um, and one of the things that our office is doing, we're now building the tallest modular building in the world. These are prefabricated units uh, that are being built in, uh, in union built uh, in a local Navy yard uh, that are being shipped to our site in Brooklyn. Uh, it'll be about a 35-story building, and it's going to bring down the cost of construction about 20% for, again, these 50, 30, 20 uh, mixed-income buildings. 
And we think that that is an enormous savings uh, in terms of New York construction. But I still believe that the basic problem that we have is, so this is a chart actually that comes from the Congressional Budget Office, which is an independent entity that talked about uh, dialing down the mortgage interest deduction, uh, taking the cap down about $100,000 a year, and that would save the country about $517 billion um, over that uh, period. I believe a big chunk of that should be dedicated to much more uh, urban affordability. Uh, and that would be not just the right ethical, moral thing to do, but the right thing to do in terms of both the environment and the economy of the country. Um, and so uh, the book closes with this, uh, this diagram that's called the whole enchilada. And what it tries to do is say, well, if we took all of those subsidies, oil and gas, the interest deductions, all of those things, um, uh, higher gas taxes, because we don't even come close to charging for the, uh, the, the cost of the pollution and the congestion that gasoline actually costs, that if we use that money and if you use just, just half of it towards the deficit and the other half towards what uh, I call the American Smart Infrastructure Act, or Asia for short, so maybe, <laughs> so maybe the guy who told me to go back to New Delhi was right, um, um, to fund um, uh, basically all of these, these pieces of urban infrastructure that we talked about, right? That, to talk about uh, better schools, better parks, more urban affordable housing, much better mass transit, high-speed rail, things like that. That essentially, that if we did all of that, not only would we end up with a surplus, but we would start to register with what the United Nations calls the three E's, right? In terms of asking us to measure society by our economy, our environment, and by social equity. And that by those three scores, that cities could be an enormous vehicle for turning around what is essentially a catastrophic situation uh, into something that is much more uh, sustainable in every way. That would mean a city like Denver, rather than looking like this, would look something like this with essentially a cluster of high-rises tied together with mass transit and parks, but with much less uh, development out there. And again, I'm a free market person, so I'm not talking about making the suburbs illegal or anything like that. What I'm essentially talking about is just balancing the playing field in terms of the subsidy regime and watching people, especially young people today, make a different set of choices with how they want to live. I think it's extremely important to remember that empires do fall. Uh, that's the fall of Rome. That's the end of the third season of Weeds. Um, <laughs> Uh, one of the great scenes on television, I think, uh, although less funny today with the wildfires that are associated with sprawl now uh, throughout the American West. Um, and so essentially, this is the country we have today. It's a country of houses, highways, and hedges. It is extraordinarily unsustainable. It's got a political system that's broken. Uh, and uh, it's still uh, very, very difficult in terms of both its economy, its environment, its lack of social mobility. I believe that in, uh, in what is a utopic vision, I'll, I'll grant you, but one in which I have a lot of faith as I deal with my own students or the young architects in our firm, uh, that people are uh, moving to cities, staying in cities, even if they can't afford the city they're in, they find a, a more affordable city to go to, that we could actually see a change in our political system. And just um, how we saw this sort of landscape of sprawl uh, emerge over really the post-war era, that we could see in another 50 years uh, a complete ch transformation of our landscape. So I'm going to close with that. Thank you very much. Well, I'm glad to see that we are having a um, debate here about sustainability. It's such a slippery word. Um, now, over the last generation, architects and planners seem to have arrived at a consensus. I'll call it the mainstream view. In order to reduce energy and uh, greenhouse gas emissions, save farmland and other desirable environmental outcomes, we should start building at higher densities, according to this viewpoint. It's a viewpoint that um, you just heard. Now, while many smart growth advocates, uh, particularly of the new urbanist variety, um, see a gradual and incremental increase in densities, we've seen some recent books extolling the virtues of very high densities. They suggest that Manhattan or Hong Kong are greenable, more green, are more sustainable living environments than low-density suburbs. Norman Foster, in his introduction to Vishan's uh, recent book, gives a good demonstration of this point of view. 
he describes sitting in his Manhattan apartment overlooking Central Park. He picks up the phone and calls his friend Vishan. In 15 minutes, they are together chatting. He claims that having people live at higher densities will mean shorter journeys, less energy use, less greenhouse gas emissions. In some ways, this prescription is highly ironic. For several thousand years, the great urban evil was too much density. Centers of cities were not just unpleasant, but they were very unhealthy for the majority of citizens. So if you lived in that ground floor apartment there in 19th century Paris, it wasn't just that it, was, it smelled bad and it was congested and noisy. Your life expectancy was years shorter than if you lived in a villa on the periphery of Paris. Almost all reputable authorities believed that it was necessary to decrease density in cities to make them livable. However, subsequent history provides an excellent example of the old adage, to be careful what you wish for. By the early 20th century, it was apparent to almost everybody that many cities in the affluent world had decentralized dramatically. So here's a typical British dwelling of the interwar years, um, still the mainstay of much housing in Britain. It's based on garden city ideas and at very low density by historic standards. Now, no sooner did this kind of landscape appear than many planners and architects decided, in fact, this wasn't the result they wanted at all. Um, these settlements, they thought, were much too low in density. They labeled these places sprawl. And this term was um, coined the way we use it currently in Britain right after World War I. Now, the earliest complaints about it were um, mostly aesthetic. That seems to be what re made people's b blood boil. And um, I have to say that aesthetic objections have remained at the core of anti-sprawl campaigns ever since. But reformers have found it difficult to convince ordinary citizens and government officials on the basis of aesthetics, so we've seen other kinds of arguments. And you know what these arguments are. You've heard them a, a hundred times, that sprawl is economically inefficient, that it destroys farmland, that it is socially destructive, it causes obesity. Um, I think that almost all of these arguments um, rest on very shaky foundations, but that's a topic for a, another day. I want to talk today um, pretty much only about sustainability. Because sustainability, for the last two decades at least, has been the Trump argument. According to this line of thought, low-density settlement uses more resources than higher-density settlement, and um, because of that is inherently unsustainable. Uh, this chart from Vishan's book, uh, purports to show that energy consumption in low-density Houston is eight times um, that of high-density cities like Hong Kong. Now, I think that this uh, very badly misrepresents the reality, but more on that later. Uh, note that Toronto, uh, just as point of comparison, is somewhere between those uh, very dense uh, European and Asian cities and the ones in the U.S. Um, by this, this um, set of data. Now, the problem with the high density is more sustainable thesis is that many of the arguments are based on misconceptions or wishful thinking. The first of these is that sprawl is recent and could be reversed if only we had the right land use policies and tax policies. Uh, for example, the mortgage interest deduction. And, and by the way, notice that the mortgage, introduction in, mortgage interest deduction in the United States applies to houses in the suburbs and condos in the city. If more people had wanted to live in the city in expensive condos, that deduction would go overwhelmingly to the city. In fact, this process of decentralization has been underway for a very long time. Clearly, something very similar was happening here in 19th century London as hundreds of thousands of modest income families moved out of the dense inner city. This was outward sprawl at, a, at least as dramatic as anything we've seen in the U.S. since World War II. Now, most of those modest, modest income families were thrilled with this new um, housing. This was wonderful. It had all the, the latest modern conveniences. It allowed them to have their own roof over their head just like rich people did. However, an artistic and intellectual elite um, was really appalled by this. They said it was ugly, destroyed the beautiful landscape, would soon become a slum. Uh, in fact, almost all of the future arguments against sprawl were heard already in the 19th century. But despite all the efforts of this elite, 
which for the, at least the last um, almost 100 years has been uh, decrying the decentralization, the suburbanization of cities, the sharp downward trend in densities has but all but universal. No matter what the political or economic system, as long as citizens had any choice in where they lived and worked. So here you're looking at Paris. We think of it as a high density city. In fact, Paris had um, nearly three million people um, only 50 years, uh, 80 years ago. It's now down to just over two million and falling fast. At the same time, the suburbs have just mushroomed. They've just exploded outward. And this is true even in the poorest countries of the world. Now, according to a very important study by Shlomo Angel, um, every city in the world, with very few exceptions, is declining and declining rather rapidly in density. So here you're looking at a crop between 1985 and 2000. Um, it has apparently been declining at the rate of 4% a year in density as the compact settlement has just exploded outward. And it's not surprising because the single family house has become the living style choice for middle class people all over the world. Very large percentages of people in the United States, I think in Canada too, still say they prefer the detached house. And polls almost everywhere else in the world echo this. In fact, I've never seen a poll anywhere that said that the majority of people would like to live in big apartment buildings. Another um, finding from Shlomo Angel, which shows that across the world, the more affluent the people are, the more space that they command. Now, it's possible that this, this centuries-long trend will reverse, and um, this talk of millennials suggests that maybe that will happen. And in fact, it is actually happening, but in the most unlikely of places. It's happening most in the fastest growing and lowest density cities of the US South and West. The LA area, for example, has become at least a third denser since 1950 and has become the densest urbanized area in America, in, in the United States, and it shares that distinction with Toronto in North America. They're almost identical in the urban areas, density. Now this has created an interesting result. As all the big old cities in the affluent world continue to decline in density, and places like LA have become much denser, there's been a remarkable convergence at between five and 15,000 people per square mile. Uh, apologize for the square miles, it's the, I, the way I think of it here. Um, it's very low by historic densities, uh, standards. And no one knows why this is happening why LA is getting so much denser. But it appears that it might be because at these kind of densities, extremely low by historic standards, you can have many of the benefits of cities, the kind of culture, the kind of, um, all the, the benefits of cities, and you can still drive a car if you want to. So here's a chart um, that shows the densities of some cities. Um, and, and actually what I mean by the cities here is the whole urban area. Now, almost every census in the world distinguishes between rural and urban, and that line um, is usually about 1,000 people per square mile. And, and you look at this chart, and you see, first of all, that every poor city in the world is very high in density. No city in the affluent world is high in density except one, Hong Kong, and we'll come back to that. Uh, notice here that uh, you see Toronto and uh, Los Angeles running neck and neck for highest densities in North America. So I think it would be um, reasonable to conclude from what I've just said that it's unlikely that we will return anytime soon to those very high densities of um, historic cities. Uh, for example, above 50,000 people per square mile. In fact, this kind of density is seen in the affluent world only in a very few places, for example, in Hong Kong, and in really a very small part of uh, Manhattan um, and a few other uh, major cities. Now in both places, as Vishan suggested, there's been a very high price to pay for that density. In Hong Kong, authorities were able to put all the British anti-sprawl planning ideas into effect. And they could do that in a way that wasn't possible in the uh, countries in the West because we happen to have democratic forms of government. 
um, Hong Kong officials have refused to allow any new development except in high density new towns. Uh, they've kept the rest of, of um, Hong Kong, uh, which is actually about 75 percent, um, in, mostly in country parks. So it's, it's actually an aesthetic thing. Now, when demand um, remains constant, uh, when demand remains constant or even increases, but you artificially constrain supply, the inevitable result is higher prices. The result in Hong Kong is by far the highest ratio of house price to income in the affluent world. In most American cities, and traditionally, it was the case that you were uh, assumed that you would have a house um, that was one third of, or that was three times, excuse me, your um, annual income. Um, so three to one was a, a normal ratio. In Hong Kong, it's 13 to one. Now, I don't think many Americans would uh, agree to live this way. Um, you see here the average unit in Hong Kong, um, something like 530 square feet, and the price. 300 to 500,000 U.S. dollars. Yes, they can make money on the subway system, but only because you can't live except in those extreme high dense places right on the subway stations. Now let's assume that urban history could make a sharp U-turn and return us to very high densities. Should we hope for that outcome? Now let's start with Norman Foster again or someone like him. Um, yes, it's a very pleasant um, that he can walk or take a short taxi ride um, when the subway is inconvenient. But one of the main reasons that this is true is because Manhattan is so expensive and there are so many more jobs than residents. This allows for an elite culture with a massive concentration of high earning individuals, restaurants, cultural activities. But it automatically means that those other people who don't live in the center of Manhattan uh, will have longer commutes and fewer of those amenities. In fact, the New York um, city air, urban area has some of the longest commutes in the U.S. despite having something on the order of 40 percent of all public transit in the United States. Now if the, the low density sprawling cities like Houston um, were to um, supposedly have um, longer commutes, um, you would think that um, that would happen, but the data for Houston shows it's not the case. The, the uh, commutes are shorter. Um, in, in time than in New York, um, in the New York area, and that's not surprising. In general, commuting times, um, except to the very densest parts of um, very big cities, are on average twice those by the private automobile. But you might say that these commuting trips are longer in distance than the ones on transit, and so use more energy and emit more greenhouse gases. Well, not necessarily. Yes, cars are slightly less efficient in energy used per vehicle mile traveled than trains, or actually slightly more, only slightly more um, than public transit in general. But in fact, cars have become so much more efficient in recent years that they are already um, using less energy per vehicle mile traveled, less greenhouse gas um, emissions than the bus in the United States, and the bus is overwhelmingly the um, bulk of, trans of public transit in the United States. Now, how can that be, you ask? Well, it's very simple. If you look at these figures from the U.S. Department of Energy, there's only 1.5 people in each car on average, but the car now gets 25 miles per gallon, and that's increasing. The bus gets two miles to the gallon, and the average number of people on a bus in the United States today is less than nine. And that's because even though when you try to take a bus in the rush hours, it's completely packed, by necessity, if they run over long periods of time, they're going to have very few people at the beginning and end of route, very few people on reverse commutes, and very few people in the middle of the night. Now let's talk about energy more generally. And for that, let's return to the Manhattanite of the Norman Foster type. Um, when American surveys of um, energy are done, they're almost always done using U.S. Census data and it's self-reported energy. So the Manhattan apartment dweller will report electricity she uses in the apartment, but not in most cases the energy used for heating and cooling in the building, the hall lights, the elevator, the swimming pool, and so on, not to mention the weekend house or second or third or fourth houses. Now I'm not sure why this is, but the Australians have actually done a much better job um, than any other country that I know of in studying energy use. 
So this is a study that was done by the government of New South Wales where they took actual electrical bills instead of self-reported and they traced all of the energy back to specific types of housing. And here's what they found. Um, this is actually looking at greenhouse gases, but it's, um, you, that could be a stand-in for energy use. Of the 33, of the part that's internal, the 32 percent, that's the part that would normally be reported in the United States. Um, but the rest of it, um, if, they had a, if they had it in a single-family house, and of course single-family house is unlikely to have a car park ventilation, um, that would not be reported. And so this is the result that they have found. And look at the right-hand um, column here. Here's the um, detached house at 2.9 tons of CO2 per person per year, which is not as good as, as the townhouses and, vi and um, villas, but notice that it's actually less greenhouse gas than the, the low-rise, the mid-rise, or the high-rise apartment building. Now let's look at a much bigger study. And again, this is an Australian study. This is the Australian Consumption Atlas, which was done by the uh, country's largest environmental organization. Here they took every BTU of energy in the country and they apportioned it to the end users when those end users were Australian. And what they found is exactly what you find if you look over decades um, and centuries, which is the more affluent the household or the, the population, the more resources it's likely to use. So the uh, top chart here, the top line here, is um, greenhouse gas, which again you can use as a, um, a substitute for energy use, and water. In both cases, consumption rises with affluence. And for our purposes here, Australia is extremely good case because in Australia the more affluent population tends to live in the city center. Thus it's no surprise that affluent Australians at the center of Sydney use much more energy and emit much more global um, uh, greenhouse gases per capita than residents of the suburbs. Of course, this is the central Sydney, Sydney there. <coughs> now here's the conclusion of this study. And let me just read the first sentence or so. Yet despite the lower environmental impacts associated with less car use, inner city households outstrip the rest of Australia in every other category of, assumption, of uh, consumption. Even in the area of housing, the opportunities for relatively efficient, compact living appear to be overwhelmed by the energy and water demands of the modern urban living. Now, I'm not trying to argue here that the residents of Hong Kong use more, ener use more energy than a suburban American family. They, clearly, they don't. Only that energy use and greenhouse gas emissions are not primarily a function of settlement type. In fact, if you figure, if you figure in um, affluence, climate, and cost of energy, um, you can uh, account for almost all of the differences in energy use and greenhouse gases. Yes, we need to cut down on greenhouse gases, and yes, we need to solve a multitude of environmental problems, but pushing people to higher densities will not necessarily save energy or cut down on greenhouse gas emissions. For me, all this debate about low density versus high density, cars versus trains, distracts us from the really pressing urban problems. What's a pressing urban issue? Well, here's one that one-third of the world's urban population lives in extreme poverty on under two dollars a day. They are dying by the tens of thousands because of the lack of clean water and wastewater treatment. They lack even the most basic resources that we take for granted in the affluent world. And amazingly, Western experts go to these countries and tell them that they should not make the mistakes we made, that they should prevent sprawl. Stopping settlements like this from spreading out is probably the worst possible advice that anybody could give. It could be a death sentence for some of these people. Now, the Rio Conference on Sustainable Development in 2012 recognized that sustainability wasn't just about environmental issues. The final report acknowledged that it's going to take a lot more ener energy to bring the really poor out of poverty. If we brought every person in the world up to the standards of the average resident of Hong Kong, that would mean a massive increase in energy, not a decrease. Clearly, we need to figure out how to do that without damaging the environment. There's another reason to lament this never-ending debate about optimum densities between private automobile and public transport um, bus or rail. Both the car and the bus and the railroad car are big, heavy, inefficient 19th century technologies. 
Today, with the development of alternative fuels, very small cars, shared cars, and driverless vehicles that could respond to calls on demand, we have the possibility for a huge increase in mobility using the infrastructure that we already have, minus much of the CO2 and the parking. But that's only a guess. I don't think any of us knows what the future, even the near future, is going to bring. From my point of view, silver bullet solutions, whether Garden City, Radiant City, Broadacre City, New Urbanist City, Hyperdense City, are not likely to give us the kind of cities most people want to live in or true sustainability. What we need for that, I would argue, is an open mind, a lot of research and experimentation into an entire range of new approaches and new technologies, and above all, a modesty about what we know about cities, which are, after all, the most complex mechanisms mankind has ever devised. Thank you. Are we all on? <clears throat> well, it would appear we at, at some point have to get to the question of um, how we compile evidence. Um, I was very struck by something you said over and over again in your book, uh, Bob, uh, the, the, your book on sprawl, uh, but it is really a, an important reminder from, uh, from a historian or, or from a, um, a serious planner, which is when we're working on cities, it's extremely important to actually look at what is and understand how it's come to be before we propose what we think it should be. That said, I think, despite the fact that it would appear that there's a difference in opinion about, about how some of these facts play out in the, built, in the built environment, there are some things actually the two of you have in common that I want to start with. Um, and that has to do with, uh, I think, a shared belief in the power of the marketplace. Uh, it, it, uh, but it plays out differently, I think, in, in, in your two views. And I think uh, a great deal of suspicion about the agency of planning. So I want to start there and ask, uh, ask uh, uh, both of you, where do where you think the role of uh, architects and planners and policymakers are in making a better city? Um, and uh, of course, following up from that, talk a little bit about, about the role of uh, of private capital in, in, in um, incentivizing the city. Who wants to start? Uh, well, I actually trained in urban planning. I think it is uh, a profession that is uh, highly problematic. I mean, Jacobs obviously called out a lot of the issues with planning as it was practiced um, uh, through the urban renewal era. but. Uh, I think that uh, there's an excellent article by a, a, a professor named Tom Campanella who wrote an article called Jane Jacobs and the Death and Life of American Planning. Uh, and basically, he argues that, uh, that Jacobs very inadvertently uh, kind of uh, 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 disempowered the planning profession to such an extent that uh, urban planning at this point, uh, I think, is a bit at a loss in terms of its role in terms of the issues we've talked about here. Um, that there is, I think, a very, very strong moral compass within the profession and a desire to help vulnerable populations and so forth. But um, I, I, if, you, if you take the profession at its uh, kind of uh, core idea that it's about planning cities, the name seems to imply that, right? Um, that it, it hasn't done a very good job at that. There's been some exceptions in places. I think London right now actually has a very good urban planning apparatus is doing some very strong things. So there, there, it's not that it's without uh, exception, but I, I certainly think in the North American context that uh, you've seen a, a lot of misguided urban planning efforts that have led us to some of the landscape that we have today. Well, I wouldn't disagree with that at all. Um, I think one thing to be said Sorry. is that um, I, th I think it's a mistake to think of planning as only what public planners do. 
everybody plans all the time. And I think that we have a, a, a grossly distorted view of planning when we think it's just what public planners do. Now, that said, I think that the problems with planning have been largely the problems that we've had about government. What should government do? Because I think there's plenty that planners have done that everybody would agree is wonderful. In Chicago, where I live, I think nobody would disagree that keeping the lakefront free and clear was a wonderful idea. So I think that there's plenty that planners have done as long as they've got the vast majority of the people behind them. I think where you run into trouble is where planners substitute their own opinion of what ought to be for that of the population at large. And I think that since the 60s particularly, uh, as planning tended to move off to the political left, uh, we've seen a lot of that. And I think that has been highly problematic. So then uh, this is an area uh, where you both uh, weigh in. Vishan, you're in, in, embedded in some of your, the, the arguments in, in the um, a country of cities is the notion that uh, both planning and some of the some of the market apparatus has limited uh, the choice, and uh, and also government policy has dis disincentivized the creation of the, of the kinds of complex urban environments you're advocating for. <clears throat> Whereas I think if I were to um, characterize your long history of sprawl, you're you're describing a, a situation which is much has a much longer uh, history in the built landscape where you are providing evidence that people have voted with their feet for, for in, in many different ways to live in less populated uh, 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 areas. Um, how do we sort that out? Which is true? Well, uh, Bob showed a slide in Mumbai, and I, I know Mumbai very well. Uh, Mumbai, depending on, it's very hard to get an exact population count, is a city of about 19 million people. Uh, 2,000 people move into inner city Mumbai every day. Uh, I think those people are voting with their feet. Uh, they're, th they're moving there because they believe, and, and my family's from Village India, so I understand this dynamic very well. Uh, those people are doing that because they believe that they can have a, a, a better life for themselves, that somehow they will live in, and I would actually disagree with some of the characterizations even of some of the slums, um, but that uh, they're doing that because they believe they can generate more income and send more income back to their families. Bottom line, they're, you know, they, they, are, they are voting with their feet. Uh, should they have better infrastructure? Should they have better housing? Absolutely. Uh, and that's something I think that the government's actually desperately trying to figure out in India. So I don't, this notion of free choice, which I think is very much a topic in both uh, talks, uh, I think is a critical one. And I don't think either of us are really people who would like to inhibit free choice. But what free choice is, is, is a very tricky thing in terms of how the market then intervenes. So for instance, uh, Bob talked about the mortgage interest deduction going to single family homes. And if, yes, of course, if you have a condo, you can also take advantage of that deduction. But the fact is, the number of condos in the United States versus the number of single family homes is a drop in the bucket. And that is not some pure market consequence. Uh, I was talking to a developer in Dallas who says, you know, I, I can't get multifamily zoning. I will build multifamily housing anywhere I can build it in downtown Dallas. The planners won't give me multifamily zoning. Is it the planners or the communities, you think? That well, are it's, it, that's exactly what's happening is, is the planner is listening to the community. And the community doesn't want the density in their neighborhood. I'm sure this is, this is a story that plays out all over uh, all over uh, the place. And, and so, you know, you have this real problem where actually private capital is trying to do, uh, in, in, at least in my framework, the better thing. Uh, and uh, they're being stopped. And so I find it interesting that it seems like both of us have this filter where we're saying that, 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 that whether you talk about the government or planning regulations or so forth, that that's a problem, that it's in the way somehow of free choice, but we come out in very different places in terms of how that manifests itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. when you started um, uh, your talk, uh, you talked about the siloing of, um, of both the professions and of the various 
uh, forces that are that have to have, have to be coordinated to build a better environment, whether it's from the from, you know engineering, <clears throat> planning, uh, you know public policy, and uh, and I have the sense from the the trajectory of your of your argument that the highly disaggregated, some uh, highly inefficient format of the of the North American environment is the result of of, of this lack of uh, synthetic coordination, which would require uh, some government oversight or someone to actually lead on that. Be because if, if you... Uh, if, if, if you I, I, actually, no, I would argue it differently. I actually think the problem is in the schools. Um, I think there's a pedagogical problem. Um, you know, in our... Part of why I'm an architect who teaches in a real estate program is because we have these students today, and they're, they're dual degree students, they're Swiss Army knives. They don't they don't think about the world as well, if I'm a good designer, then I can't run numbers or I can't think about policy. They just don't think that way. They don't think in this world of silos. They think in this much more horizontal way. And I actually, when I, when I interact with those students, and we hire a lot of them because they're really smart, um, I, I, it gives me great hope because they simply don't have in their heads a lot of the ideological divides that I think that, you know, my generation was the tail end of that ideological divide. And so I actually don't think, because I, I think those people make their way into policy making, development, design, whatever it is, they will all you know, figure out the apparatus, they're smart enough to do that, but it has to start with the mindset. I tend to think that this um, divide that we have between public and private is highly um, overstated. Um, first of all, so much of what we do in private business is governed by all kinds of laws and courts and um, every individual is both um, a voter um, on the one hand and a consumer. So they're already in both camps. So I think that the idea that somehow you need one agency or the other to do something, I don't think so. I think you could probably have good results from either. I think planners have done very good jobs on quite a few things. A lot of public agencies uh, seem to have worked really beautifully. Uh, let's use the U.S. Postal Service. This was an incredible organization for many, many years. No longer is. I don't know all the reasons for that, but um, that's a good example of government working really well. On the other hand, um, let's talk about planning. You suggest that you would need a lot of coordination to make these high-density cities work. Notice this, that those places that we really like, Paris, uh, Manhattan, central Chicago, those places were done without almost any public planning, or at least the public planning in the case of Paris was only limited to some very specific corridors. So I don't think that um, you can say that one or the other inherently works you better. You don't think the 1811 commissioner's grid of Manhattan was public planning? Or the Burnham plan the, for Chicago? Or the Burnham plan for Chicago? Which is privately commissioned, but they, still a plan. They were, but the grid simply laid out where the streets would be. Every, anything could have happened on that grid. The same with the plan of Chicago. It, it focused on a few public things, but it left out a consideration 98% of the city. It said nothing really about housing or about businesses other than, um, well, what it did talk about was mostly just infrastructure. Now, granted, that guides the, the, um, the growth in a big way, but notice that most of that infrastructure was private at the time. But I, I think to, to get in, in, into the weeds here a little bit, because I think this is an interesting territory, we do tend to point to, uh, as, as Jane Jacobs said, by the way, to cities that were formed in a, a certain period of hi history, kind of mercantile cities formed on a grid, uh, subdivided in very particular ways, which do provide for a, a, a certain degree of flexibility and transformation over time. Um, so we see those cities being very resilient in terms of their transformation. But we also have environments uh, outside of those cities which are not formed with those uh, patterns of land subdivision, which have very large single purpose infrastructure, highways, other land uses, which make it very, sometimes very difficult for them to, to transform them, uh, whether, whether to make them more dense. I mean, you, you, the, the, there could be a counter argument to yours, Vishan, that Instead of, instead of working on intensifying the 3% or even the 10%, that if you could increase the density of the other 95%, uh, 
by 5%. You could, you could transform the level of sociability. We could argue about the metrics of, of energy. Um, that that would have a, a more profound effect on, on, on the social life and on the, the, uh, the everyday experience of, of the population than, than concentrating so much on the downtown. Because, because in the case of Toronto, for example, the old downtown um, is in some ways taking care of itself pretty well. It's the areas outside the old mercantile grid that are struggling. Well, but again, I mean, the book is very much about the U.S. context, and mm -hmm. I, where, where I'm going to agree and disagree with you is take a city like Charlotte, North Carolina, which is a city actually where my wife grew up, I, so I've been traveling back and forth to that city for 15 years and often you know, not hanging around my in-laws, and so therefore out looking at what's happening in the landscape. <laughs> uh, my in-laws are lovely people, I'm joking. Um, uh, but what's extraordinary, you look at a place like downtown Charlotte, and what have they done? They've built a light rail system. They've built all this housing along the light rail system, and it is about 30 units per acre. And by the way, I have a slide that I didn't show that 30 units per acre is not a skyscraper. It's you know, it's basically, you know, four or five story brownstones. It can be a lot of different things in terms of how it manifests itself physically. But Charlotte has built precisely that kind of housing. It's enormously popular. Um, and so it's still a, a sprawling, auto-oriented city by and large. But part of my impulse to write the book is I felt like the urban planning profession or the people who write about urbanism uh, you know, we talk about seaside Florida and new urbanism and all of this other stuff that doesn't matter a hill of beans to the average American. But at the, at the same time, we seem to just ignore, you know, Charlotte and Memphis and, and, and uh, uh, Chicago and these, these enormous engines for us in terms of the economy and the environment. I'm going to stick to my guns on the, en on the energy metrics and we should come back to that. Um, that, that I find that these places are just largely ignored by, certainly by uh, the academic classes or even the, the books that are written about these places. And so that's what I really wanted to get into. So that does get into the mercantile grids of those cities, because those grids formed for a reason. They were near a subway, uh, excuse me, they were near a, a freight rail stop or a river or something that made that original city grow. And it's the, most American cities and most American mayors are rediscovering their inner cities and doing things about it. Los Angeles isn't just magically densifying. Los Angeles is densifying because it's in response to a market demand, and it is because there is strong government policy to build new density around the subway lines that Los Angeles is building. Right? That's not just happening. It's because there's a strong, strong commitment to having it happen. That Los Angeles density was increasing starting in 1950. The railroad line, um, that rail line, is largely insignificant, as is almost all of the new transportation that we're putting in in the way of light rail. Now, I don't mind light rail. I think it's great where it goes from a high-density place to another high-density place, but it's insignificant in American urbanism. Ninety-seven percent of all trips in the um, United States, at any rate, are done by um, or vehicle trips are done by private automobile. Almost all of the transit is done in four or five cities. For the rest of the United States, it's, it is really just about negligible, and it's negligible, that rail line is negligible in LA as well. The little pockets of density, but that's clearly not what has been driving it. Bob, you have an amazing ability to take the situation as it exists a priori and say that is therefore the reason it should exist. Right? I mean, this is the problem. I mean, we have 80 million young people in the country who don't want to live that way. I'm not saying every last person of those 80 million people, but study after study after study shows that it's not the way they want to live. Right? And they are reconsidering this as deeply socially conscientious generation. Um, you know, I don't know what cars run on in Australia, or I don't know what houses are heated by in Australia, but I think most people, whether they look at data or not, just in terms of common sense, understand that you're going to use less fossil fuel if you bicycle or you take uh, um, mass transit to work than if you drive a gas guzzler. And I, I, find, I find this whole question of, like, 
it's an aesthetic thing, and my, my favorite part is the elitist part. So basically, so for the person who's arguing that someone should take mass transit, that's elitist. If you can take your, your, your Escalade to work, that's not elitist, that's responding to the marketplace. I find this extraordinary, it, it's, it, it's the most extraordinary sort of upside down universe. I, I, don't, I don't really understand it. Um, and lastly, just on this affluence point, here's the thing, there are very many affluent people in Manhattan, obviously. If you take an affluent family that lives in an apartment in Manhattan and compare that same affluent family who lives in Greenwich, Connecticut with six cars and an 8,000 square foot home, I, I, I don't think, I mean, you guys can decide whether you look at his data or my data, you can decide who you think has a, a larger carbon footprint in that circumstance, right? Uh, and, and, you know, think about what then therefore makes sense in terms of sustainability and whether we should be incentivizing that person to go buy that large home in, in Greenwich, Connecticut, or actually we should create a city that's attractive, not just to uh, uh, lower income people, which I talked about extensively, but that it's a good thing, and this has been one of Mayor Bloomberg's point, points, is to, to keep those people in the city, right? And I, so I don't think we need to have a sort of class warfare argument over sustainability, right? The point is, is that we should be uh, attracting people of all income brackets into cities to, live, to be living more sustainable lifestyles. But the question will come up, um, what we, it, let's say, uh, and, and both of you have kind of, I think to some extent, projective scenarios. Uh, um, Bob is more circumspect because, because he likes to base his, his uh, conclusions on, his, on a, a kind of uh, a deeper historical, uh, or on a kind of historical narrative. But there, the, 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 we have geographies that were created by, you know, let's say even in North America, by maritime uh, trade, then by uh, railroads, then by, then by largely a kind of car, uh, an automobile uh, um, culture. Um, if, in, under your scenario, uh, and I'm going to come back to why this is important, the, the, the next generation of people are going to vote with their feet and abandon that, the, 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 the highway geography of the car uh, and re-inhabit differently, as you show in some of the drawings, this um, previous landscape. Will there be enough of it? Or will we have to manufacture more of it? I think what we're going to see is, uh, so take a state like New Jersey, which is the densest state in the United States, actually. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to see intensification around the railway stops, because historically, of course, in the US, where the mass transit was, was often like the bad neighborhood. That's where like the low income people hung out because they didn't have a car. That's all changing rather dramatically to the point where most mass transit organizations now are actually trying to figure out how to take all those surface parking lots that are around their transit stations and turn them into multifamily housing. There are places like Patchogue, Long Island that have figured this out and built a bunch of housing, both for young people and for empty nesters who are interested in a different lifestyle. So I do think the market's responding, but it's responding in patches and it's largely responding against a, a, a 1950s uh, 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 subsidy apparatus and regulatory apparatus. And that's what really needs to change to unleash the wave of market demand there is for that lifestyle. So there'll only be enough if we really start thinking differently about our geography. And by the way, I'll just close by saying that doesn't mean people won't drive. I, I own a car. I drive 1,000 miles a year. I've driven cross country three times. Driving is great. We shouldn't conflate that with driving to work for two hours outside of Atlanta. It's not the same thing as driving cross country. It's not Thelma and Louise, you know? And so I, I, th I think we just have to be careful about what kind of lifestyle that means and that it doesn't mean everyone is cordoned off in Hong Kong. Well, I, I think w one of the debates we're seeing between uh, the two of you is how we compile evidence. You know, we have a, a project at our faculty, the Global Cities Indicators Facility, that's trying to compile uh, data on things like density, carbon footprint, you know, uh, mobility in cities so that we can compare them more one-to-one -one because, because uh, and, and you talk about this a lot in the, in the early parts of your book, how difficult it is to get a, a handle, uh, Bob, uh, on what's actually going uh, on in these places. But I, I, I still, so, so, so I think, uh, I don't want to speak for you, but I, I think what I'm hearing from you, Bob, is that 
it is true that these, 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 um, there are these uh, emerging tendencies and, uh, and uh, a desire on, on, on a certain cohort of young people to live in a certain way. But the question that will always be, what percentage of the population is that, right? Um, and, well, I will, so maybe you want to speak to that a little bit. Yeah, this is a very interesting um, question. Um, and by the way, I'm making no brief here for the sprawl or the suburbs. <laughs> um, I live in the city. I live in the densest part of Chicago. Um, but I don't believe that the way I want to live is necessarily the way everyone else wants to live. Um, it is uh, true that these polls that are coming out show that millennials seem to be um, less interested in having a, driving, uh, owning a car, excuse me, um, and they seem to be less interested in living in suburbs and in city. Part of this is that we didn't have those polls in the 1950s. Every generation, uh, my generation, I grew up um, thinking I couldn't wait to get out of the suburbs, um, but most of my peers are back in the suburbs after they have children, so we'll see what happens. I can readily imagine that we could see a whole generation of people that want high density. I think one of the ways that if you, if you look at history, one of the things that's driven almost all of urban um, development has been people of more modest income looking at their social and economic betters and trying to emulate that. And I think that's what caused a lot of the suburbs. Okay, now if we look at the wealthiest people in the world, they tend not to live out in the suburbs in almost any city. They, um, since the 1920s, the richest Americans um, have not continued to move out. If anything, they've started to move back in. So it is possible that we'll see a huge demand for high density living. But one of the curiosities here is that when that happens, and that gentrification that's, that's so visible in so many cities now, uh, Toronto included, happens, the very same people who are against sprawl are against increased density in the city because they know that the view will be blocked. Yes. That even if you we use, agree. Even, even, <laughs> even if you have a, an extensive public transportation system, when you double the density, the transit use will only go up 25%. The rest of that is going to be automobiles, and it's going to just mean more congestion. So all across North America, as the gentrification crowd has moved in, they put limits on density just the way they try to put limits on sprawl at the edge. So that could change. But um, it's, a, it's a dynamic that's pitting some very strong forces against each other. I actually totally agree with that. Uh, and it's, it's very much a dynamic. I just wanted to, just one comment. We talk so much about transit and transit-oriented density. But one thing that I think is happening in many cities, it's certainly happening in New York. New York 10 years ago was a hub-and-spoke city. There were two major business districts. Everyone moved in and out of those business districts to go to work. What you now see in the city today, particularly because of the uh, advent of a lot of technology companies in the city, is there are people who live and work in Brooklyn who go to Manhattan every six months. Uh, it's, an it's a huge sea change for the city. And this idea, we're working on two projects where there's office space being built, in one case in the Lower East Side, in another case uh, in, on the Brooklyn waterfront in Williamsburg. And if someone had told me five years ago we'd be designing new office space, in those locations, I would tell them they had a very tight panty on their head. It's <laughs> extraordinary. It's extraordinary. And it changes this whole notion of biking to work, all of these things that in the midtown Manhattan context seem a little nutty. Um, and I think this is very important because I think in terms of the point Bob just made, is if in those areas you can bring people along on the density conversation, you actually create a new form of sustainability, which is a lot less sort of infrastructure heavy, a lot less about spending billions of dollars on new subways or whatever, which I still think is important. But places that are much more sort of self-contained urban neighborhoods, which is actually what Jacob's talked about, but from a market perspective, often hard to do, but it is happening. And so I think that's an interesting piece of the conversation. Yeah, I agree with that. And to go back to the millennials not wanting to own cars, uh, one reason for that is because we already have more cars, registered cars, than we, um, re than we have citizens. Um, another reason is that so they can get drives from other people. But the other thing about that is that it's made a profound change when we see these um, shared cars, the iGos and the, um, the zip cars. Because I think that there's, uh, I think this is the beginning of the revolution that I'm talking about, that 
we know that those millennials aren't using transit more. All the studies show that, and transit use is down in almost every city in the affluent world, even after spending billions of dollars on it, in Europe as in the United States. Um, the, the transit has inched up in some cities like New York, but for the whole urban area, it's, the modal share is still down. So I think that we're looking possibly at this great transformation, that we're going to move away from cars and from rail and from buses into some much more flexible system that operates like a car but without most of the problems of the car. We, we know that the late Bill Mitchell imagined some of those things. <clears throat> I, I want to close, we need to wrap up, uh, but I want to acknowledge one thing, at, uh, and, um, which is the remarkable um, visual rhetoric of your book and the maps and drawings, which are really, in my mind, conceived to bring out um, your argument to a very broad audience. So, in, in, so you do take the mantle of a planner, which understands that you, 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 one needs to take uh, difficult, complex conditions, uh, architectural, landscape, uh, 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 otherwise, and boil them down in a way which, where they can be explained. I mean, there's, there's a kind of history of that form of communication, but one of the failures of planning um, uh, is that we haven't seen a lot of uh, drawings like that in the public realm where, 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 where the arguments are made so starkly. Whether, whether they're always, whether we can debate about whether the evidence is, is, has always been well vetted. So I wanted, in closing, I wanted to get, Bob, your, your, your sense about the, the because, because really you are, you are making a, um, you're making it, you know, many people say the 50s, the, the suburbs were sold through advertising and through public relations. And you are actually making, through these drawings, uh, a sustained argument for uh, going in a different direction through a vehicle that only really architects and planners could, could conjure. And, and I don't know what, 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 what you're thinking, what, how, how you responded to, to the, the drawings, actually, uh, and to the, the argument, the, the rhetorical character of the, of the book. Well, I think the drawings are very powerful in making the case. Now, I'm not happy with the data that's behind some of those um, charts, but I, clearly it's, it's, very, um, it's very compelling. And I think, actually, if architects and planners would learn to do more of this, that is to say, lay out alternative schemes, not think that their preferences should be what should govern, but lay out the schemes for the population at large to um, choose, and by that, you have to believe that the electorate is smart enough to make choices that won't diminish life for their children. I think it is. Um, I think that's really the role of, of planners and architects, to envision what could be, and in multiple scenarios. I, I would just, a quick thing on the drawings. It's interesting. When I worked in urban planning, when I worked for the Bloomberg administration, if I told someone that at a cocktail party, I'd find myself very alone with my drink in the corner, right? Because no one really, urban planning is not the most exciting topic for most people, but I actually find that, um, that with the drawings, the whole idea, and even I teach a seminar around the book, that people actually are very interested in talking about how they live. And what I find very, because it's very personal, these are very personal issues. And what I find so compelling is that we don't have a national conversation or an international conversation about how we live. Uh, and so that's not so much urban planning or any of the sort of specific disciplines that we chop all of this stuff into, but just how do we choose to live and how do we get to those choices? And those are, I think, conversations that are very important and healthy for people to have, and I don't think we have enough of. We just sort of assume that, well, if that person made that choice, then maybe I should make that choice. And, you know, it doesn't necessarily work that way. And so that's what I, I actually have found a lot of... Um, of, of positive feedback from that, just engendering some personal conversation about how we got to where we got. Well, I want to thank both of you for an incredibly stimulating and uh, um, provocative uh, set of presentations and for raising these issues so we can all think further about how we live and how we plan. So thank you. Uh, I should mention, um, sometimes if we don't run over, we take questions. But if you have questions for the speakers, you can e email them to, or you can even tweet them to our, our Daniels. Uh, uh, and I'll, I'll do my best to get them to Vishan and, and, and Bob. OK, thank you. Thank you.